Okay. Yesterday, we uh, were looking in the colours of the prisms, and then to, at the end, we came to this, what Goethe was looking for, what he called an instance worth a thousand, bearing all within itself. And that shows him, if you can find it, that shows him what he calls the primal phenomenon, which is oh, the earth phenomenon, which is actually what is always there whenever colours are formed. And the colours will be formed in all sorts of different ways, but that primal phenomenon will always be there. And we came to see how, through working with the colour of the sun and the colour of the sky, he was able to recognise that when we see the red, orange, yellow, <coughs> we're, we're seeing light uh, through, through the darkening effect of a medium. And when we see the various blues, we're seeing dark through the lightening effect of the same medium, which relative to, to the dark has a lightening effect, whereas relative to the light, it has a darkening effect. You can see this is thinking in a relational, contextual kind of way. And so what we find with that is quite extraordinary, that when we look at the colours <coughs> of these edge spectra, the two that we were looking at, then actually we're seeing the colours of the sun and the sky. When we look at the colours of the sun and the sky, we're actually seeing the colours of the edge spectra through the prism. And of course, under certain circumstances, <coughs> you get green, and people were talking about the green flash, and some of that which some people have seen, some people haven't done. <laughs> some people were too lazy on the plane to wake up to see it, I remember. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, there you are. Um, so this is, this is what we did. And then um, you can now, from this, you can begin to get a sense of why the colours, the, the fact that the colours are in the order red, orange, yellow, is not accidental. There's a, uh, there's a kind of necessity in the fact that they're going to be in that order. Um, you can see this because of the way in which the colour of uh, the lightning of the darkening of light takes place. It will have to be red, orange, yellow. Now we don't know easily how it is that the um, the prism produces this phenomenon. It's a very complex business. I've never really seen any adequate account of it. But somehow or other, <coughs> uh, we won't go into that, the prism is providing the conditions needed for the, for the colour phenomenon to appear, and then when that's gone, they simply disappear. And, and the important point is, the colours are excited in the light, when the conditions are right. And when the conditions change, the colour changes. When the conditions go completely, the colours go completely. This is how it is seen in this way. We're looking into the coming into being of the colours. And uh, did I talk about the sun is yellow when the sky is blue? Yes. I did that. Yeah, that, that's why I hesitated a moment ago. So anyway, I didn't know whether I'd done it or I haven't. Um, we did look at that and say, well, normally you just look and say, yeah, sun, yellow, yeah, sky blue, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one and the other, isn't it? Um, but then after you've done this, you actually can see there's a relationship there in the colours. That when the sun is yellow, the sky must be blue. It can't not be blue when the sun is yellow because those are the conditions for the sun to be yellow are the same conditions for the sky to be blue. Um, so you can't not have it. And so now you have their belonging together it's, wow, the sun is yellow and the sky is blue and that's one whole. There's a wholeness there now in the colours. 
which I, when I first worked with this, I did find quite quite remarkable. Actually, that's just it's quite 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 stunning. Uh, I'm, I'm having trouble today because uh, I've got myself muddled up, and I've thought it through several times. And each time I've thought it through, I've got myself more muddled up about the order in which I'm doing things. Yes, yes, that's right. So I'm just talking to myself. Uh, I'm going to do this next. That's right. Oh yes, I've, that's what went wrong. I've turned over two pages, and I'm looking at the wrong thing. My prompt. Here we are. Now, here's a very simple case where you can see this phenomenon. Um, first of all, oh yes, I'm sure that's been computer enhanced. But there's a nice picture of sunrise in California. I didn't think it had been computer. Didn't think about that. I thought it was lovely. It's a calendar. It's near Mendocino. Uh, is it Mendocino or Mendocino? Mendocino. Mendocino. <coughs> yes, it's not Italian, it's Spanish. Yes, okay. So, anyway, there, there it is. And I showed it to a class here one day. I always used to show this at the end of what I did and say to people, now you see the difference. If I'd shown you this at the beginning, think of this at the beginning and think of now how you're seeing this. All the meaning there is there, the difference. Um, and I thought that was a good thing to do. And people used to say, you, oh yeah, wow. And someone sat there and said, oh, it's been computer enhanced. <laughs> 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 so, uh, in my naivety, of course, my enthusiasm, <laughs> it never occurred to me, but there you are, that's what they do, but it looks good. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and so yeah, you could do, couldn't you? Actually, the, yes, the, the the colors have been adjusted somewhat, but yeah. um, nothing's put, been put in there that wasn't there. Well, it wasn't there. Okay, thank you very much. That's a very um, uh, um, encouraging comment. Thank you. <laughs> yes, so, and there we have it. And I, I do think in every time I do show it, people say, "Now, you, when you see that." You see it quite differently from how you would have done if we hadn't done any of this work on, on Goethe's approach to colour. So that shows it's something that we've learned. We're seeing that differently. I rather like that anyway. But what I was going to show was this very straightforward phenomenon, not as easy to make as it seems. I've tried it. What we've got here, make sure I don't show the wrong one first. Ah, there. <coughs> We've got here a, a glass vessel with a, a, it's a, a, a colourless, it's white isn't it, semi-transparent medium. It's water and you add stuff to it. And I forgot what stuff you add. Um, I'll tell you that in a minute. And um, you get this, this, this condition and there's a, it's a black behind it. Now, what we're now going to do is we're going to take exactly that and not touch it in any way and we're going to put a light behind it and we're going to look at that light through the medium and that's what we get and you can see it now the light and the medium appears reddish isn't it okay we're looking at the light behind now what we're then going to do without touching it at all we're going to move the light to the side and we're going to illuminate it to the side and there it is because what now you've got is you've got the same <coughs> medium but the light is coming from the side so the medium is is illuminated itself with the light and you're now looking at dark through that light filled medium the dark of the of the background behind so you're seeing there that dark background behind seen through a light filled medium as here you're seeing <coughs> what you're seeing here uh, the, light. the light you're seeing the light through this medium which is actually the one that's having the darkening effect have you got that mm -hmm. 
Um, so there you've got the darkening of light and the lightening of dark. I did try to do this myself once and it didn't. I couldn't get it to work. Um, so I mentioned this. I actually funded enough to someone in California when I was there who was really good at these things. That was called Dennis Klosak. And he said, oh yes, he said, you can do it. What you need to do is you need to pick some horse chestnuts where they're ripe and grind them up into a powder. And I find if you put those and something else into water, it really works very well. <laughs> He'd actually gone back. <laughs> He's that kind of bloke. He'd actually gone back to the way people did this originally round right about Goethe's time to do this kind of thing, you know. And I thought it was just a question of our, uh, adding some chemical or something, you know, a bottle or something, put, put something in. And I tried, and it just, I never got it to work, ever. Um, and uh, he'd done it, and it does work. So when I accidentally came across these pictures, I thought, wow, I don't need to try anymore. So these pictures are here. And so there we are. Um, and that's a very good example of how when the conditions are right, the colours appear. And when the conditions change, the colour changes and so on and that. Uh, so actually this darkening of light and lightening of dark is something that you can see wherever colour phenomena appear in a natural way. With bl blue mountains, you look at mountains for a long distance, they look blue and so on and all of that, and the blue water, and all of that, you know, depth of water. And you can see it everywhere. It's a very natural thing. And as I've said, the prism phenomenon is not easy to understand, and I don't pretend to understand it, how that actually does it. Because somehow or other, what's happening with that prism is it is setting up the conditions which are needed for the colours to be excited in the light. And which colours and excited depends upon, in a way, which part of the prism the light is, is coming through. Because the prism is like that. So some of the light is going to go through a greater thickness of prism, some of it is going to go through a, a less, less thick. What's the English? Thinner. Thinner. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thinner part of the prism. Um, and that, will make, that makes a difference. How the whole thing actually works, to be honest, I think the only honest is that no one ever seems to have really figured out how the prism does it. And you can get into quite complicated um, ar arrangements, like for example, uh, yeah. you end up with you end up with diagrams like that, which I don't think you want me to do. Very, 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 uh, you know, you don't, like, you don't like the look of that, do you? No. So we're not going to do that. You end up with something like that, and you have to visualise as a whole, and you have to visualise the fact that light which goes through different parts of the prism is attenuated in intensity by different amounts. And you have to hold that all together as one whole in your, in your mind as you visualise this. Now I did, some years ago, in the 1970s, actually really work at this and try it. And I swear that one, one night, uh, it actually just... And I swear, I saw how it happened. And I thought, that's it! And after that, I could never see it again. So it must have been a fake. I faked it. I don't know. But I've never seen an explanation anywhere that really convincingly... Uh, describes how the prism provides the conditions for the lightning of dark and the darkening of light. Now, Goethe tried to do it in a certain way, but actually uh, it, it doesn't work. I widely admit it, it just, what he said doesn't, doesn't really work. But it doesn't matter, doesn't that? We can ignore that, because we now learn to see the colours that we saw in the prism in the, in the sky, and everything and, and other things. So what matters is the phenomenon to hold on to this thing. But what you come to here is that when the conditions are right, the light when the conditions are right, the light the colour will be excited in the light and the colours will change as the conditions change and so on and that. That's the key thing to actually hold on to. Uh, good. 
Now, I want to say more about this primary phenomenon business. This, well, in this case, no. The primary phenomenon is fine. It's the darkening of light and the lightening of dark. That's the primal phenomenon. But I want to say more about this instance worth a thousand bearing all within itself. That I think this is a very key thing for Goethe. And um, I just want to look at it a little bit. Because it shows that Goethe's way of proceeding is phenomenological instead of just empirical. An empirical procedure would simply collect together many different instances of the colour phenomenon and try to abstract what they had in common uh, by comparing them. And the presence of that, what they had in common, would then be taken to be essential for the occurrence of the phenomenon, colour. Which is a, a procedure of induction or generalisation from many cases. We looked at this case and that case and that case and that case and that case and we find that in all these cases what they have in common is X. Therefore X is actually the key thing. Now it's clear that Goethe doesn't work in that way at all. He doesn't, put, he doesn't collect together lots and lots and lots and lots of different phenomena and ask what they have in common. He says that the essential thing can be seen in one instance if you can find it. It's worth a thousand instances, you see. Oh, that's the inductive generalisation. It's worth a thousand. One will do it if you can see it. And it has to be an instance which uh, bears all within itself. It's there for a special instance. And here, this is a very remarkable thing um, because he sees the idea in this one particular case. Only one instance is needed for what is essential. This doesn't mean it happens all at once. It doesn't necessarily happen clearly. You may have a great deal of difficulty finding this instance. It, it, very often instances have lots of contingent and accidental factors in them which are confusing um, and they obscure what is essential. So what is needed is an instance in which all these secondary factors are, as it were, reduced to a minimum so that the pure phenomenon can be seen as if it shines through it. And that phenomenologically is the function of that. Um, the main thing is that he learned to see, therefore, the coming into being of the colours in the phenomenon itself. He sees the coming into being of the colours in the instance worth a thousand bearing all within itself. He sees it there. So he sees the fundamental idea, what it, it appears, in the phenomenon itself. Which is quite different from the usual way of working, where you try to find an explanation by going outside of the phenomenon. Here is the phenomenon, what explains it? Oh, I've got something over here, quite different. That would explain it. Oh, it's caused by the light waves. And light waves have actually got different wavelengths. Oh, that'll do it. Different, this is explained by different wavelengths of light waves. You've immediately introduced something which simply isn't there in the phenomenon at all. Because that doesn't appear in the phenomenon. You've introduced this. This may be very valuable. It may be very useful indeed. If you're doing technical optics, it's extremely useful. But it's not phenomenological. It's not actually telling you what colour is. Although by now, after 300 years, we've managed to convince ourselves it is telling us what colour it is, because it's something which has got nothing to do with colour, but it will actually give you an explanation which you can use for purposes of calculation. And that's terribly important, measurement and calculation, because then you can really refine your optical instruments terrifically. And so I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the way theory of light is. There isn't. It's very, very good. Those, those of you who used to have cameras before everything turned into uh, mobile phones and so on and that will have greatly benefited from all that kind of thing. Because you wouldn't like it if you took pictures and you found there was false colour images all over things and they were all distorted. And get, getting all that sorted out 
required the wave theory of light and all that sort of business. So those of us who have used optical instruments of any kind have uh, greatly benefited from that kind of thing. So there's no point in knocking it <laughs> because you might as well chuck your camera in the bin if you're going to knock it out. Um, so I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. My father isn't. But it's brought in from outside and added to the phenomenon. And it doesn't actually tell you anything about colour itself as a phenomenon in this, this sensuous, experiential, intuitive way. Um, so th this brings me back, of course, to the quote I had from the beginning with Heidegger, when I said, well, Goethe's seeing was phenomenological seeing, not merely empirical, in which the idea belonging to the phenomenon appears in the phenomenon itself. As Heidegger put it, the idea belonging to the phenomenon is unfolded from the phenomenon itself according to the manner of its being instead of being imposed upon it. So it's unfolded from the phenomenon itself. I say it's unfolded within the phenomenon itself from the phenomenon itself according to its manner of being instead of being opposed, imposed on it in a way which isn't according to its manner of being. And this is, I think this is illustrated beautifully <coughs> by what Goethe did. Um, another aspect of this, which I would like to pick up on, I think, he said, uh, is that um, this instance worth a thousand, bearing all within itself, also expresses the way in which for Goethe, the relationship <coughs> between the universal and the particular is, 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 is somewhat different from the way we usually think of it. He turns it inside out. He's actually saying here, we see in this case the universal through the particular. We see the universal, as it were, shining through the particular. Suddenly, the particular is seen universally because the universal shines through it. So the particular is raised to the universal by the universal shining through it. And that's very interesting because in the usual relationship it isn't like that at all because normally uh, the particular is just seen as an instance of the universal. For example, triangles. When you draw a triangle, every triangle is just seen as an instance of the universal triangle. You don't have this experience that with one triangle you see the essence of triangularity shining through it. You might come to that later if you work for it, but that's not how you come to that. Um, what you do is you learn, uh, you, you see you see each triangle as simply as an instance of the universal. But here, we're actually seeing the universal shining through the particular. So we come to the universal through the particular. In the other case, you lose the particularity for the universal. So it turns it inside out. And he's working much more, therefore, in a poetic way, um, I hope you can follow that. Um, he, he has a quote, I have a quote, um, uh, I'll just read this. Uh, he, in, in one passage, he talks here about the difference between allegory, I call it allegory, what do you call it? Allegory. You call it that, allegory. And you know, it's pronouncing it right, allegory. Allegory. A difference between allegory and poetry. He says, it makes a great difference whether the poet seeks the particular for the universal or beholds the universal in the particular. So in one case you could just find the particulars that fitted the universal. In the other case you actually see the universal in the particular. <clears throat> From the first procedure 
originates allegory, allegory, blah, blah, blah. Um, <clears throat> that's where the, you seek the particular for the universal. Where the particular is considered only as an illustration, an example of the universal. But in poetry, it expresses the latter, the second procedure, in which you behold the universal <coughs> in particular, is properly the nature of poetry. It expresses something particular without thinking of the universal or pointing to it. Whoever grasps this particular in a living way will simultaneously receive the universal too, without ever becoming aware of it or even realising it only, or realise it only later. He's talking about poetry here. And this is of course how it works. You read, you read a particular poem and it's about a particular say an encounter between a man and a woman and something's happened. But the poem isn't actually about that encounter between the man and the woman. It is. But actually it's about that encounter between the man and the woman raised to the universal. Because something universal comes through it. Shines through the particular case. So the particular case is what it is but it's illuminated by the universal which it illuminates. So again we've got this, this double figure, this figure of eight lying on its side, that the universal, I can't, don't think I can say it now, uh, I said it once, I hope you got it. If I try to say it again I'll get it wrong. Uh, <laughs> but that's how it is with poetry, whereas with, with um, uh, Ali, whatever, Ali? Allegory. Allegory. Um, then in that case they're separate and there is the particular and the universal, and the particular is used simply to illustrate the universal. You've already got the universal. It's, all there. it's not that you're seeing the universal through the particular, and so the particular is seen as an instance of the universal. You're just using it, and that's why it's quite dull. Um, and there are, of course, in the medieval period, sorry, Renaissance period, and well, late medieval period, uh, allegory was used a great deal in poetry. Spencer's Fairy Queen, for example, which no doubt you will all have read, um, is, is uh, allegory all the way through. And you can actually then, you know, you can, you can do the business of, well, um, what does this represent and what does that represent and so on. And intellectually, it may be very satisfying, but poetically, it's extremely dull. However, when you get a poem, like I was just saying, something that somehow or other, you see a perfectly ordinary situation described in this poem, and it is like a window through which something is coming. Which is that situation illuminated, and you see, you see that in that, that way, that I said. And so he talks about, I always found this terrific, this particular thing he said about poetry. Because I realised when I read it, yeah, well that's what he does in the science. That's the instance worth a thousand, bearing it all within itself. Because... He's seeing there the universal shining through the particular. And that particular will allow the universal to do that. It's a very special particular. And that's the whole coming to presence in the part. It's a special part of this one. Okay? It's the same thing. And this, when you think about it, it's very beautiful. <coughs> and it's an inside-out way of thinking. In the mathematical case, you have the universal triangle, and every triangle is simply an instance of that universal triangle. Okay, I've said enough about that. Um, because I want to say a bit more about, well, no, I'm not going to say more about that. Um, uh, I haven't got a copy of my monograph with me, which is in the book. Uh, I can't, I'll get, there's a drawing on the front. Which has significance. Since I haven't got the book here, there's no point in pointing out the significance of a drawing you can't even see. Right, okay, so that's that one done. Right, good. Let us now pass on from that. Um, <laughs> no, uh, the monograph. Oh, yeah. I wrote a monograph called Goethe's Scientific Consciousness, which is included in the Wholeness of Nature. Um, and that was published in 1986, ten years before. But the only reason the Wholeness of Nature was written. 
I did this monograph, Go to Scientific Consciousness, which is based on a paper I gave on Goethe and the hermeneutic phenomenology of nature, hermeneutic phenomenology of nature, to the British Society for Phenomenology Annual General Meeting in 1980. And then I wrote that up. And they wouldn't want to publish that because it's not done in a scholarly way with footnotes, because it was actually based on the seeing. It went down very well. They, they, they really liked it, because on, on the Sunday morning, they always used to do something which is of a, a bit wider interest among the members. So I got, I, I got in there. So then I wrote it up because it's when I realised I had this problem in it because I wanted to say well, what's actually happening here is there's a, there's a, there's a change in consciousness. Um, hence the title Goethe's Scientific Consciousness. Well, they couldn't say that to academics easily because they, don't, they just mean a change of consciousness. It just means, oh, you change your mind and something, you've got something else in your mind. Uh, they didn't understand what changing consciousness meant. And so I thought, well, what can I do about this? And then I thought, I, I know, I'll, I'll fake it. Um, what happens is, I'll, uh, I'll get... I remember that Orstein had written this book on the psychology of consciousness. And there was a lot on that, and, so, and, so, and I'd read the book. Uh, Orstein was one of these people from California. And so I said, he's a professor, so I thought. Uh, I then, so I said, what I'll do when I give a talk, and I'll say, uh, the ch ch uh, this is a change in consciousness here, as a, in the kind of way described by, by people like Professor Ornstein. So I thought, if you just say professor, it'll be okay, because they, they recognise the word professor. <laughs> and so it, it worked a dream. Uh, it was marvellous, and there's no problem to it at all. So when I'm driving back home, on, down the motorway, I start to think about this, and I thought, well, oh, I don't know. I wonder, what was it he said, I wonder if there's anything in this. When I got home, I took the work down off the shelf. And that's when I realised that what I said actually fitted the thing. And that this whole business about different modes of consciousness, one which is uh, in intuitive, sensuous, and the other which is verbal, intellectual, fitted the Goethe case completely. And therefore it illustrated this difference between the two sides of the brain. And that's what I was going to write up and did. But by the time I got to write it up, it was a few years later, the brain stuff had gone stupid. It had been taken over by um, peculiar forms of feminism and management consultants and God knows what. And I just couldn't, couldn't, couldn't face it. Um, and so uh, I, 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 I did it without, I missed that out. Which I'm now uh, with McGilchrist, I can put back again, done properly. So that's, that, that was how I did that. And the book was an accident. Um, actually, it was Ornstein himself who was supposed to look after the selling of my book in America. And he didn't seem to bother very much. So he <coughs> had a great trouble getting hold of it. Um, and I think probably it was because I, I mentioned a man called Arthur Dykeman, who was a friend of Ornstein's and not much about Ornstein. I learned later from someone that Dykeman and Ornstein were locked in battle with one another as to who was the greatest psychologist in the world. One, each thought they were. And I had made the mistake of mentioning Dykeman and not Ornstein. So maybe Dykeman, Ornstein sat on my book because I, you know, I hadn't done that, I don't know. But I got this letter then from Lindisfarne, some two years later, saying we've got great difficulty getting hold of your book, we want to republish it. Would you, and we want to put in the wholeness, <coughs> can't be authentic, would you like to write a few words on your later thoughts on Goethe? So I said, well, yes. Because I knew I had to say yes. I couldn't say to them the truth. I haven't had any more thoughts on Goethe. After 1986, I gave a couple of workshops, and I never thought about Goethe again. I was into other things. I wasn't interested in Goethe. I'd, I'd, done, I'd done Goethe. Um, and that was it, you know. And um, so but I knew I had to say yes. So I, I had to think of something. And um, I had reviewed a book for some people. I don't do book reviews, but they've been very kind to me. And they wanted me to review a book from, so I did, by Dennis Sepper called Goethe Come to Newton, in which he brought out the way in which Goethe had actually used the history of science. And he said that the, the history of science is science itself. Well, wow, this is what I was actually into at the time, was the philosophy and history of science and the historicity of scientific knowledge. So I thought, I'll base it on that. I'll have, I'll have extra thoughts. I don't know what I'll do. All this stuff I'm teaching, I'll put that in. That'll fill a few pages up. 
And so I did. And the result was that doorstop thing you've got there, um, all, those, all that stuff at the end, was really done by accident. Um, I, I never intended to do it. I did all the stuff on the history. And I thought, oh my God, I haven't mentioned Goethe. I've done about 100 and God knows how many pages. I haven't mentioned Goethe. So I better do something on Goethe. So I did the Goethe on colour based on something I discovered by accident. And then I thought, oh my God, I better do something on the Banerjee. And I was so bored by them, I got naughty. I described the Banerjee backwards um, to see what it looked like. I started with the archetypal idea and worked down to the organism, whereas everyone starts from the organism and goes the other way. And I just did that to see how it worked. And I was so bored at one point, it was a diagram, where I put a picture in, uh, I made it wrong. You know those, you get those lovely sequences of plant silhouettes going round. When I did that, and one of them, I cocked it over the other way. <laughs> I just did it, because I, I was bored. <laughs> I, I did this, and I thought, oh, it doesn't matter, the publisher will sort it out. But of course, the publisher didn't, because they thought, they thought there was some meaning in this. <laughs> So there it is in the book. This thing goes out. This cock hide one. <laughs> you know, so the book came out and suddenly there's this guy Henry bought of who's an expert on Goethe. Entirely by accident. <laughs> and that's how it happened, you know. So it's, it's been a strange life, I must say. Uh, be careful what you do. It may come back to haunt you. <laughs> Anyway, there we are. Yeah, this you have to work by far makes up the bulk of the book. Right? Yeah, it does, I know, that's the thing about it. I sometimes say to her, I've run, oh, I've run out of breath, that's what I've done. I've, I've run out of coffees, coffees now. <laughs> <laughs> Freudian slip. <laughs> I've run out of copies of, of, of the monograph. Um, I'd like to show people it, but I haven't got any copies. Um, and it's very thin. And I say to people, don't bother with the big book, buy this little one, uh, which only costs six pounds or something. But, and that's the thing I first did. Uh, some people have said, well, actually, it's, it's quite concentrated. So if you read the... I personally, I wouldn't read the rest, unless you're really interested. I would read the bit in there that's called Goethe's Scientific Consciousness. Which isn't all that long. You've worked on the wholeness paper. There's a bit on the end on Goethe on that. That I would read. And I'd read the bit that's called, second part, which is called Goethe's Scientific Consciousness. And I, I would ignore the rest of the book. Um, but if you want to do the phenomenology of seeing, as I mentioned, the first chapter in the third part uh, the, on the organising idea, I'd read that. And then... I wouldn't bother with the rest. I'll mention something in a bit about what I say about Colour and Newton there, and I'll tell you why I did that in that way. Um, but you don't need to bother with all the rest. Um, so that helps. And um, Right. Now I, I've got, now, I want to say a bit more about this... Uh, oh, I am saying a bit more about Parliament Phenomena. <coughs> uh, this... Uh, this idea that when you can see the idea shining through in a particularly clear instance is, is very much a, a feature of phenomenology. Usually the idea is that you, people have the idea, you abstract the idea from something, or as in modern science, you bring the idea by imagination to something. But in phenomenology, you find that you can actually see the essential idea in some it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a development of seeing and so you can see it directly it's not just that you have things given empirically and then you have to find the idea you can actually go through the empirical to see the idea directly um, and if you work with the, the, that chapter on the organising idea you'll see what that means so I, I think, for example I got an, an example I quite liked, that I've not developed it, uh, which I found in a book by Erasim Kohak called Experience and Idea, which I think is a lovely book, but I don't know if it's still available, which is a phenomenological book, and I found very clear. He talks about jealousy, and he says, Jealousy 
has a logic of its own which we can grasp. In other words, the very idea of jealousy. It's got its own structure. And when we do, we see this. We don't infer it from cases of, of jealousy. We don't deduce it. We don't speculate about it. We can actually see jealousy directly. Yeah, what do we see? He says, well, take, for example, what, well, I was going to say, what you want. Since there are in any examples of jealousy, there's going to be a myriad of factors which aren't really important. You want to find an instance worth a thousand bearing all within itself. And that is Othello. Shakespeare's Othello shows the structure of jealousy clearly. And so that's a, an example of this, what they call the logic of jealousy stands forth without you being overwhelmed by the empirical facts. Whereas if you start off to describe a situation, like, and this is a quote, he puts this, I'll let us. <sighs> An empirical report of the observed behaviour of the commanding officer of the Venetian armed forces, his wife and his chief of staff, would yield a cumbersome mass of trivia about the life of military officers and their dependents. Shakespeare's fictional account of Othello cuts through all that, presenting the pure eidos of the complex phenomenon, jealousy. Eidos is the Greek word for the idea. And so that's, uh, I thought, was a very good example. I thought I was, I was quite... Uh, that Othello is an instance in a thousand bearing all within itself. The fact that it's pre present in the imaginative mode of consciousness instead of in the perceptual mode of consciousness as actual experience doesn't make any difference to its phenomenological function. So if, if that's, that's the thing. If you try to do this in the ordinary way, empirically, to find out what jealousy is, you would just simply get bogged down in all the irrelevant details of people's lives. Um, I, I thought that was a very interesting idea. You approach it phenomenologically, so you see the very idea of jealousy shining through. Well, I thought there was something interesting in that. Um, now, Ero, uh, Erosim Kohak's book, Experience and Idea, is a commentary on the second volume, a very complicated book by Husserl, published in 1913. Called, it's always called Ideas One. There's Ideas One, Ideas Two, Ideas Three. And it's a very complicated subtitle, which I can't remember at the moment. And that's just fortunate because you would be frightened by it. Um, the Kohak's commentary is sheer genius, it's sheer lucidity, and you can learn a lot from it. It's not going to deal with the appearance, but it deals a great deal with how, in our perception, the, in the experience, the idea is there, and we see the idea in the experience. We don't speculate on it, we don't infer it, we don't deduce it and then add it to it. We see ideas directly and experience. And it's actually very, very... I found a very, very good book. But it's slightly off what I'm talking about. How, how do you spell his name? Uh, Kohak. K-O-H-A-K. -A -K. And it's got a, an acute accent on the end of the name. <coughs> University of Chicago Press. I, don't, I found it by accident. Uh, really, I did. And it was in a bookshop. And it was l lying on the books. Someone had taken it out, looked at it, and not put it back. And I was caught by the table. Oh, oh that's interesting. Picked it up, and I thought, bloody hell, this is more than interesting. This is fantastic. Um, well, uh, extraordinary. And I mean, I've read the book several times, and I find it terribly valuable. A little bit more in it than you would want. But you can pick things up from it. Um, so th th and that's where I got this, this example from. I hope this, I hope, do you find that, do you find that um, helpful to think about Othello in the same context mm -hmm. and so on? I'm not, I don't know. I've not, I've, not, I've not mentioned that before. This is part of a lecture I gave at the University of, uh, Columbia University in New York in 1999, uh, and I forgot about it until I woke up one night in the middle of the night before I was coming here, and it came into my mind, and so I thought, I'll take that down with me, but I now, I want to say still a little bit more about this, uh, about this wretched instance worth a thousand bearing all within itself. And then after that, it will bring me to coffee. 
something has to be said about the influence of Francis Bacon on, on Goethe. The two Bacons in history, Roger Bacon in the 13th century, Francis Bacon in the 16th slash 17th century. Again, people muddle them up. Roger Bacon had an enormous influence on the development of science in the medieval period. Um, Francis Bacon had an enormous influence on the development of science later on. He was the hero of the Royal Society when it was formed in 1660. And they had a big bust of Bacon there and so on. But the strange thing about Bacon is it's actually very difficult to see in what way his writings on science were actually helpful to the development of science. It's often been pointed out that science didn't actually work in the way in which he said it would. That he did predict the idea of big research teams and scientific institutions and so on. And he was a source of inspiration and vision. But it wasn't until the 19th century. See, I don't think it was until the 19th century the scientific revolution really happened. And that's actually when what they called the Baconian sciences developed, when people really started to explore empirically the phenomenon of light, the phenomenon of magnetism, the phenomenon of heat, the phenomenon of electricity, the phenomenon, and all that business as phenomenon. Before that, it had been very mathematical. But Bacon's always been famous because he, it is said, advocated the method of induction whereby you, we just mentioned this in effect, you would find many different cases and try to generalise from them, reach a generalisation. Something like, um, oh, this metal melted when it was heated, another metal melted when heated, then there's another one melted when heated, we shall therefore conclude that all metals melt when heated. And it was generally supposed that this was how scientific work was done, and that Bacon had advocated this. And I sort of grew up with that, well, it seemed clear that it didn't actually work that way because of the mathematics. Um, so I grew up with that, and the big thing about, and it affected a lot of people here and in Germany and so on, uh, he had a huge influence. But it, there was then realised um, by various people at different times in the 20th century, that science wasn't like that at all. And so there was a huge change. People realised that in Germany. No, <coughs> so Heidegger realised it. <coughs> France, Bachelard realised it. Kangolein realised it. And then in America, of course, it was Thomas Kuhn and so on, and all those people realised that science just doesn't work in that way. Um, but the extraordinary thing is, it's the power of the image that Bacon never said it worked in that way. Bacon himself did not advocate the method for which he is universally famous. He actually does include this method and says, well, you won't get very far with it. it won't, that won't take you very far. Um, <clears throat> he said specifically that this is called enumerative induction is a puerile thing and leads to no result. This is what he's famous for advocating as being the royal road of science. A puerile thing that leads to no results. So the universal prejudice that Bacon was a naive empiricist, what he called merely an empiric it has been shown to be completely unjustified. <coughs> so that's the first thing that needs to be said. Um, <coughs> now, Goethe had a considerable debt to Bacon because if he was going to go into scientific work, given the, how famous Bacon was and how much people looked up to him, he's going to be one of the first people he's going to look at. Everyone would have done it in his time. And so he did. And he actually begins, at the beginning, by admiring the philosophy of Bacon, and he regarded him 
as an authority on scientific me method, and he based his own ideas on how to do science on Bacon's. That's why he did these kinds of, <coughs> sorry, a basic observational work and so on. And so on. But he actually starts to do it in a different way. But that's why you have all laid the phenomena out. And he thought all you had to do was do that and people would look and they'd see the truth of it and so on and that, which didn't happen. But then later on, he changed completely his attitude towards Bacon. And he said that his influence, I'm quoting, his influence did, I'm quoting from something else, his influence did more harm than good and he called him, this is a quote from her, a Hercules who cleanses a stable of dialectic dung only to fill it up again with empirical dung. Well, what Bacon wanted to do was to cut out all this stuff that the Aristotelians did, and they had nothing to do with Aristotle, by the way. It, we're talking um, 1,800 years or more since Aristotle's death. They were Aristotelians, but they had no more to do, you know, 1,800 years later. You can't blame on Aristotle. Um, and they wanted to work everything out by argument, dialectic, dialectical. And he said, well, this is dialectical dung. And like Hercules cleaned the Orgium stables, is it? Yeah. Well, Bacon cleaned out the stables of science of all this dialectical dung, but then he filled it up with empirical dung, says Goethe. And later, Goethe's secretary, towards the end of his life, a man called Reimer, he, he recorded, dictated comments on Bacon, said that Goethe had called him the chief of all Philistines. And he now strongly objected to Goethe, to Bacon, on the way. So he said, Bacon granted too much privilege to the single facts. So that, quote, life vanishes and forces get exhausted. And now, he says, he who cannot realise that one instance is often worth a thousand, bearing all within itself, he who proves unable to comprehend and esteem what we call earth phenomena, time of phenomena, will never be in a position to advance anything, either to his own or, or to others' joy and profit. That's where this comes in, in his criticism of Bacon. <coughs> well, I have believed all this for decades. And then I was asked to give a course in a certain place on the history of science, because they'd done a lot on this and people liked what I did. But they said to me this time, by the way, you'll have to include Bacon. I said, I can't do that. I can't stand Bacon. I said, I really can't stand Bacon at all. I think he's dreadful. And I think actually the, the image they've had of his influence in science is quite wrong. And they said, well, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to include him because we've just got to have him in there because, um, you know, he's important. And you may not like him, but you're going to have to include him. Oh, God, I've got, I've got to go and look up about Bacon. Anyway, I did. And because as soon as I start to look into Bacon, I discover these things that Bacon's completely different to the picture that's being portrayed of him. And here, this, this I'm relying here on a book by H.B. Nisbet, Goethe and the Scientific Tradition, Institute of Germanic Studies, University of London, 1972, who goes into this in some detail. And the double irony here is that, in fact, this instance worth a thousand bearing all within itself, is just what Bacon himself wanted to do. And Goethe, who condemns Bacon for having no sense for the special case of the one instance worth a thousand, may well have learnt this from Bacon in the first place. Because in Bacon's writing, it's clear that he did not give all the phenomena equal value, so that you just too much privilege to single facts which exhausts all life and everything he said, says Goethe. Uh, <coughs> Bacon, in his Novum Organum, which Goethe had read, singled out certain instances which are especially instructive. And he emphasises what he calls the shining instances or the striking instances. And here's what he said. This is Bacon. The, they are those instances which exhibit the nature in question naked and standing by itself and also in exaltation or highest degree of power as being disenthralled 
and freed from all impediments. But can you see that that's exactly the same idea as an instance worth a thousand bearing all within itself from which all secondary factors have fallen away? It's clearly the same idea in d different words. And I think that in the end that Goethe was less than generous to Bacon. But I also think that ba Goethe managed to do what Bacon wanted to do but couldn't do. Because I have no doubt about it that Bacon couldn't actually do what he wanted to do. He wrote about it. He saw this. When he tried to do things and didn't work, he didn't get anywhere. And I think the one person who did get somewhere with it was Goethe. And this has all got obscured. Now, I, I gave this in this talk at the University of Columbia quite deliberately because I knew there was going to be a lot of uh, <coughs> very strong, important Goetheness there from the Germanic tradition. And they certainly wouldn't like this. Um, because the, their view is that Bacon was a terrible man. But he was, he was a very difficult man. He, he treated women very badly, they say. Well, yeah, who didn't in those days, you know. I mean, he did treat women very badly, you know, and so on and that. Uh, but, but, hey, you can't judge the guy's scientific work on how he treats women, can you? I mean, not really. But yeah, I, I never liked Bacon. I think he was a tricky customer. Um, but, so what? There's a lot of tricky customers. You can't, you know... So I, I just think that, um, so another one of my ways, nobody likes this, another way of freeing Goethe from, 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 from the kind of Goethe thing would be to say, well, actually, he managed to do the true Baconian science that Bacon couldn't do. But you'd, I wouldn't dare do that because people would misunderstand Bacon so much. The idea that the, his shining instance but it's a shining instance. It's an appearing instance. Shining. If something shines, what's it do? It appears. A shining instance. It appears. An instance worth a thousand. Bearing all within itself. It's a shining instance. The very word shining. It, sh it says appearing. In the phenomenon. The idea appears in the phenomenon. And this, this sadly, you see, what happened is, which we're going to mention after the break, we come to... Newton's famous experimentum crucis. The crucial experiment, crucis meaning cross, also the cross, where it's like a kind of crossroads, which he believed was what Bacon had said. Now, I wish to God I'd written this down and kept it. In the early 1960s, I found a book in Putney Library of various essays by a chap had written on Goethe, no, on Newton. And in a footnote, in one of them, he had actually said that the experimental crucis, experimental crucis is a misunderstanding. Uh, Bacon didn't call it that. Newton thought he called it that. And Bacon, uh, Newton got that from Robert Boyle, also in the Royal Society, who mistranslated what Bacon had said. Bacon had said, uh, experimental something, which was actually the shining instance. So the whole experimental crucis idea, about which is so said, was actually a, a mistaken idea in the first place, even with Newton, um, that it, uh, which misrepresented what goes. Unfortunately, I never wrote that down, and I can't remember now where it is. But I do, it's come back to me. It's one of those things that comes back to me in the middle of the night, from time to time. The lost opportunity. The key to it all was in a book in Putney in 1962. <laughs> <laughs> so. I, I'm not going to pursue ever this view. The, the consequences would be so horrendous. Um, but I do think that what I've just said, I do think it may have some truth in it. I don't say it's the complete truth, but I do think there's some, something, some truth in it. Um, so, and this is also is interesting because of the way in which our understanding is usually based on a series of distortions which have been passed down to us. I hope that's illuminating. That finishes what I'm going to say about the instance worth a thousand very more than itself. What I'm going to do after, we're going back to the prisons in a minute, and, and we're going to look and see how we can come to understand the difference between Newton and Goethe much more clearly and sensibly.
and is often written about. Is that all right? Yeah, very good. Yeah, OK. Science could have gone a totally different way if people had understood. What it could have gone phenomenological. Hmm. It wouldn't have gone in a certain way because the real science, the one that really developed, which one of the things I draw out in that book a lot, is actually the real basis was mathematical. Hmm. And in that, that article that's in the Holistic Science Journal, um, that's, an, that's the final part of a much longer article, which is called Go to Modern Science. And the whole of the first part, which is all, almost all the article, is on the mathematical basis of modern science. And it goes into why Descartes did what he did, in, and all sorts of things, how that can be all... You read, I sent it you, didn't yeah. I? Yeah. Um, but of course, that's supposed to be published by Pete. I've never heard from him, and probably never heard from him again. Mm. Um, so that's it. I mean, but... If anyone wanted to read that article, right. I'm very happy for people to do that. Mm. I've, I've discovered a couple of typos in it, but I'm very sad. But never mind. But if, you've got a copy, haven't you? Yeah. Well, if anyone wants to read it, right. I'm perfectly happy mm. to let people read it. Oh, very generous. But there's no point in it sitting on the shelf somewhere. Yeah. I don't think I'll ever hear from Pete again, so I, mean, right. I don't know what he's going to do with it. And right. that's why I'm going to put it in the book. It wasn't planned to. All right. But I'm going to put it in the book to make what I'm doing to make sure that that thing does get published. Mm. Yeah. And that deals with the mathematical basis, which people don't know about. Mm. And I think, actually, it's very interesting. So anyone who wants to, you can read it. Mm. Yeah, I'll put it on the Moodle, because I suppose how this is full of internet. On the Noodle? The Moodle. <laughs> <laughs> the Moodle is this... I think it's next to the moon. Yeah. Yeah. Don't tell me. Right. It's time for coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>